Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Brian Lynn and Andrew Smith. They each will tell us of ways people in different parts of the world are trying to reduce their need for energy. At the end of today's program, you will hear from Ana Mateo with the newest episode of Words and Their Stories. Also, Jill Robbins and I present the Higher Education Report. But first, this story about the latest phone and watch releases from Apple. Apple and some other technology companies say they are aiming to keep prices level this year. The maker of the popular iPhone announced a list of new products recently. In addition to adding safety features such as emergency satellite connections to the new products, the California-based company stayed away from major price increases on most products. The popular mobile phones create about half of the company's yearly sales. The new iPhone 14 models are priced the same as last year's iPhone 13s, they will be $799 and $899. The costliest phones are the iPhone Pro and the iPhone Pro Max. They will cost $999 and $1,099. The main changes to the phones are related to the quality of the pictures they take and longer battery life. Only the Pro phones got new computer chips. Technology experts say Apple is trying to reach new customers by adding safety features. Ben Beharin works for market research company Creative Strategies. He said the new safety features are super interesting and add value to the phones. He said the phone's ability to connect to a satellite so it can make an emergency call from places far away from cities makes you not just want the products for yourself, but for loved ones. The phones also have motion sensing technology that permits them to recognize an accident, such as a car crash and call for help. The phones will also be able to use the Find My program to share where they are using a satellite. The special service will come for two years at no extra cost. Apple also provided new watch information. The company is adding features that may appeal to athletes who do things like run or ride bicycles long distances. One watch called the Ultra will have a longer battery life so it can follow an athlete's progress during events that take many hours to finish. They also will be able to better resist water than in the past. The watches can also call for help if the user has been in a crash. Phones and watches make up the majority of Apple's business. The main news from this year's release had to do with prices and safety features, but no new products. In the future, some experts think Apple will release some kind of mixed reality headset, which could come as soon as next year. This suggests the device would let users combine the computer-created world with the real one. I'm Dan Friedel.
A German farmer is successfully growing apples beneath solar power equipment that produces electricity. It is currently harvest season for Christian Nachtwey, who operates an apple farm or orchard in the western German town of Gelsdorf. A reporter from the Associated Press recently visited Nachtwey as workers loaded up red L-star apples ready to be shipped to stores. In addition to apples, Nachtwey's farm also produces a second harvest, electricity. Many of the farm's trees grow beneath solar panels that have been producing power during this year's unusually sunny summer. In addition to providing electricity, the panels protect the fruit below with shade. Nachtwey said the idea behind the farm is simple. The design protects the trees from getting too much sun without reducing the available growing area. On top of that, there's the solar electricity being generated on the same land, Nachtwey said. Putting solar equipment on the same land as crops is becoming increasingly popular in Europe and North America. Farmers are finding that this model can make the most of their land while establishing a second way to earn money. But getting the right mix of crop and solar is difficult. Most fruit requires specific growing conditions. Even small changes in the environment can harm crops and cause financial losses. Even if the fruit survives, it might turn the wrong color or be less sweet and may be difficult to sell. For this reason, Nachtwey is working with researchers to test which kinds of apples well under a solar cover. He is also investigating which kinds of solar panels work best in the orchard. For testing purposes, Nachtwey covered some of his trees with a traditional netting material. It is normally used to protect sensitive crops from damaging weather events. Jürgen Zimmer is an expert with the area's Agricultural Services Department. He told the AP that apples grown under the solar covers were a little less sweet this year than those under the nets. But almost no solar-shaded apples got damaged in the intense sunlight that hit the area on July 24th. In the non-shaded group, about 18% of apples suffered sun damage that day, Simmer said. We need at least two to three full years to record all the weather conditions that might occur, he added. Simmer and Nakvai will also need to look at crop production levels and how the solar covers affect fruit color. Researchers hope the tests will show that fruit crops perform well under solar panels. This could help prevent renewable energy production from competing for valuable agricultural land. That competition has become an increasing concern as the need for renewable energy increases to fight climate change and rising food prices. I'm Brian.
The state of Hawaii recently closed its last electricity production center fueled by coal. The closure is part of its effort to decrease the use of fossil fuels, such as coal and oil, and to increase the use of renewable energy resources. The coal plant had operated for 30 years. It produced up to one fifth of the electricity on the island of Oahu, the most populous island in Hawaii. The state's population is nearly 1.5 million people. In 2020, Hawaii's legislature passed a law banning the use of coal for energy production by the start of 2023. Hawaii has set a goal to move to 100% renewable energy by 2045. It was the first state to set such a goal. Hawaii's Governor David Ige recently spoke with the Associated Press. He said, It really is about reducing greenhouse gases. Scientists say greenhouse gases. In the Earth's atmosphere, trap heat and contribute to the warming of the atmosphere. Ige said the power plant emitted 1.5 metric tons of greenhouse gases each year. People in the state say the Hawaiian Islands have suffered the effects of climate change. These effects include the destruction of coral reefs from warming sea temperatures, sea level rise, intense storms, and drought that is increasing the risk of wildfires in the state. However, not everyone thinks closing the power plant is a good idea. They say the state will now have to burn more oil. Because the coal plant is no longer operating. Hawaii Electric Company estimated that ending the use of coal and the additional cost of oil will result in a 7% increase in electricity bills for consumers. It later lowered the estimate to 4% based on reports of lower oil prices. Democratic Party State Senator Glenn Wakai said Hawaii was changing from the cheapest fossil fuel to the most expensive fossil fuel. He also said, If you pay an electricity bill, this is a disastrous day for you. Hawaii is joining 10 other states that do not produce electricity from coal. That information comes from Global Energy Monitor, an organization that promotes the use of renewable energy around the world. In 2001, there were about 1,100 coal burning plants in the United States. More than half have stopped operating since then, with most switching to natural gas. Hawaii already gets about 40% of its power from sustainable sources, but oil provides more than half of its electricity. Kurt Favela is a state senator from the Republican Party. He suggested that Hawaiian Electric Company and other energy companies should pay some of the additional cost of changing to renewable energy. Hawaiian Electric Company is the state's only provider of electricity. It said it cannot do very much to change the prices that consumers pay because it does not set prices. AES Corporation is the operator of Hawaii's last coal plant. Leonardo Moreno, president of AES Corporation's Clean Energy Division, said, Renewables are getting cheaper by the day. He said that he can see a future where renewable energy is low cost and abundant. 
Scott Glenn is Hawaii's chief energy officer. He said that coal is getting more costly. Glenn also said, We are already feeling the effects of climate change. He said it is not fair to ask other states or countries to help with climate change if Hawaii does not also help. I'm Andrew Smith. Indian students have been coming to universities in the United States, Britain, Canada, and Australia for many years. But now that much of the nation is facing economic problems, students from lower-income rural families are coming. They are gathering as much money as possible and asking universities for admission. Sashin is a 19-year-old student who only uses one name. He spoke with the Reuters news agency about his future. My dream is to settle abroad, as I see no future in India, he said. Sashin's father withdrew all his money from the bank and also got a loan so his son could get a student visa to attend college in Canada. The money, over $25,000, went to an agency called Western Overseas that helps students learn English and get permission to study abroad. Sashin plans to go to Canada for a two-year study program in business. He hopes that once he is there, the business degree will help him get a job and a work visa. He said, Canada has fewer restrictions on students staying to work after finishing a school program compared to the U.S. and Britain. Sashin thinks the financial risk is worth it. He has two friends in Canada who are working while going to school. They earn about $900 each month from part-time work. Government agencies and education businesses follow the number of international students in countries like the U.S., Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. They said there were about one million Indian students studying abroad in the first part of 2022. That number is two times higher than before the COVID-19 pandemic restricted international travel and it is likely to continue to increase. For one, a new trade agreement between India and Australia means it will be easier for Indian students to study in places like Sydney. In addition, education experts believe universities are more interested in Indian students than before. That is because it is harder for Chinese students to travel. COVID-19 restrictions are still in place in China because of its zero-COVID policy. But the path to success in another country is not easy. The first problem is that many nations are having trouble processing student visas. Many visa offices reduced their work hours or stopped holding student visa interviews during the first part of the pandemic. And the cost of attendance is extremely high, even if a student is accepted to a university in another country. Nitika Mishra is a student studying broadcasting in London, Ontario. Mishra said international students must pay three times the amount Canadian students pay. It is a huge amount, Mishra said, especially when it gets converted back into the Indian currency. And... The value of the Indian rupee has gone down by 7% this year. Many Indians see college abroad as their best chance to have a better life. They see it as worth the risk. In the past, 
Joining the military seemed like a good idea, but India recently reduced pay and job security for military members. For example, India is no longer promising lifetime employment to soldiers. The government also reduced benefits offered to members of the military. The changes resulted in protests earlier this year and made many young people think again about their job plans. Vijay Chauhan is 18. He once thought about joining the army and even went to take an entrance test. But now I see no incentive to join, he said. He is now taking English classes at Western Overseas. He does not see a future in staying in India. There is no option but to quit India, he said. In the past, young Indians without a lot of money might not have been aware of the possibility of going away to school. But with more and more people getting internet service, they are receiving information about the visa companies like Western Overseas. Some students go to information events at hotels in large cities to learn about study opportunities. Others can watch events conducted by video call. At one event, over 500 students gathered to hear about universities in Australia and Canada. Bupesh Sharma is head of marketing for Western Overseas. Sharma said the company uses Facebook and other social media services to talk about its successes. The company has sent almost 1,000 students to school in other countries. The leader of the company, Pradeep Balian, said he hopes to send 5,000 students abroad this year. The company has offices in nine large cities in India, plus Canada and Australia. Companies like Western Overseas see the opportunity to get more customers because there are two big problems for young people in India right now. The country is having trouble offering enough higher education for its 300 million students. And for those who do not go to school, there is not enough work. It is a bigger problem for women, as only 25% of women in India hold jobs. Canadian universities are having success getting Indian students. They are working with international education companies like Apply Board and IDP Education, based in Australia, to find students. David Tubbs is Director of Marketing Communications with Apply Board. He said, the company is connecting with Canadian universities on one side and the Indian visa agencies on the other. Canada had the second highest number of Indian students last year. That is more than Australia and Britain, but about 300,000 students fewer than the U.S. But that number may change because many Indian families are seeing good results sending their children to Canada. Rahul Oswal runs an education company called Wisdom Overseas. He says there is a rush of Indian students coming to Canada. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we talk about common expressions in the English language. We give examples, and we talk about when and how to use them. Today, we talk about pointless, useless actions. And we have a very descriptive expression to help us do that. For this expression, let's go to the beach. For a beach trip, 
we bring several things that can make the trip more enjoyable. For example, a beach towel makes sitting on the sand more comfortable. Some people choose to bring a beach chair. And a beach umbrella protects you from the sun's powerful rays. Swimming in the ocean can really make you hungry. So, many people bring a cooler for food and drinks. Making sandcastles on the beach is a fun activity. So, bringing sand digging tools like a shovel and a bucket is a good idea. But you do not need to bring the sand. Most beaches have a lot of that already. And that brings us to today's expression bringing sand to the beach. Bringing sand to the beach. Describes actions that are pointless and unnecessary. The actions are futile. This means serving no purpose. To bring sand to the beach can also mean overkill. Overkill means to do or have more than is necessary or useful. Often, when using this expression, we say like. For example, bringing flowers to the opening of a florist is like bringing sand to the beach. Now, let's hear this expression used between two friends. They talk about an upcoming party and what they are bringing. Hey, Ingrid's yearly birthday party is tomorrow. What are you bringing? I made a great music playlist. The songs I picked will definitely get people up and dancing. What about you? I thought I'd bring my famous spinach dip. Um, your spinach dip? You know, I wouldn't bring food. Ingrid always makes too much food. And she is such a good cook. Bringing food to her party is like bringing sand to the beach. Well, I know Ingrid makes lots of great food, but she doesn't make my spinach dip. Every party needs spinach dip. I've tasted your spinach dip. No party needs that. Ouch! That is so cold. Why don't you bring some balloons? Everyone likes balloons. We usually use like bringing sand to the beach, when bringing something to a location is unnecessary. But you can also say the same idea with different objects and locations. For example, I could also say it is like bringing a sandwich to a restaurant. With this example, the meaning goes one step further. It also means that what you are bringing, the sandwich, is of lesser quality than what you would find at the location, the restaurant. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Thank you, Anna. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thanks to my colleagues Brian Lynn, Andrew Smith, and Jill Robbins. And thank you for listening. Be sure to join us again tomorrow to keep learning English with stories from around the world. I'm Dan Friedel.